Hello and welcome to another episode of Let's Argue About Plants, the podcast for people who love plants. Just not always the same ones. I'm Steve Aiken, the editor at large of Fine Gardening Magazine. <laughs> I'm Danielle Sherry, and I am the executive editor at Fine Gardening Magazine. And the reason there was that pause, dear listeners, is this is take two or take 200. I can't keep track at this point. And last time I stole Steve's line, and he was like, Well, I guess I'm Danielle Sherry. So we were talking about how that wouldn't that be the twist of all twists that I'm actually Steve and and that guy over there is actually Danielle. <laughs> well, I, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't wish someone else being me on anyone. So, <laughs> no, nor would I wish anyone to be me either. Um, so today's topic, Steve, um, much to my surprise, you didn't like again. <laughs> but the topic today is just for perennials, and the reason that I chose just for perennials as a topic is because. I'm always fascinated to ask a gardener when you get into their garden, okay, if forced to, what would be the one plant you would take with you from this garden if you could only take one? And I gave us four. So I thought that was fair. Yeah, but that's not, um, that's not how I answered the question. So um, (laughs) anyway, I mean, just, just for the record, I don't like any, anything at first, you know, it's because I got got to do something. Um, So yeah, that's all. I mean, it's a fine topic. I mean, it's, so I mean, what what was your approach? Why to the why topic? four? Uh, well, it's just like um, good uh, all around perennials, and I didn't do four that would hang together as a combination, and Not I didn't have either. any and any set criteria other than you know these are plants you could really rely on for low maintenance, um, mm-hmm. and and pretty much like all all season good looks. Uh, yeah, they're just they're ones that you kind of don't have to worry about. They they make me look good is what I think because like oh, oh there they are doing their thing and people are like wow that looks impressive mm-hmm. you must be a great gardener so <laughs> um, I, I guess it's all about extrinsic you know rewards um, with this list <laughs> and the accolades yeah I guess that was the approach that I took too you know these aren't the ones that I would you know run into the garden they're not my specimen you know trees or anything like that it's not it's not the plant that I would go if you know the apocalypse was happening and I got one plant to take with me, but it's definitely, you know, I went to, I've had so many friends over the years, the last few years who have gotten into gardening and, you know, have bought first homes and started first gardening at first gardens. And these four plants, I find myself repeatedly recommending, you know, they're ones that I do have in my garden, but I repeatedly recommend them to beginners all the way up through experienced gardeners. And and that was kind of how I zeroed in. Um, and truth be told, I also picked some things that I haven't talked about 8 million times already on the podcast before, because well, well, that was difficult. <laughs> right. And, and that was a thing. Because like, uh, if I had only four perennials, it would probably be a lot of the perennials that I've already talked about a zillion times on the show. And I think I've mentioned pretty much all of these on the show before. Yeah. But I think, I think you know, like you, there's no getting around that. Like I can't mm-hmm. say if I only had four perennials, there would be these, these weird four cultivars that I've only barely grown. That's, that's disingenuous and not fair. Yeah. Um, and, and so if people have heard about these of course there's nothing you know shocking on my list but it, it it should emphasize the sort of i don't know importance of these plants or the reliability of these plants or the the, mm-hmm. the ability uh for, for us to have them in our gardens have them look great without any effort on our part uh and, yes. and have them have them do their thing um so that's that's kind of where i was coming from and if if you've heard of course you've, you've heard me talk about these plants before but it's just you know Repetition means emphasis. So, yeah, and put that in context. That if we've mentioned it this many times, it's obviously a really dynamic plant. However, we had some crossovers. We actually had crossovers of what two plants? Yeah, yeah. I mean, what did you do? So I sent my list to Steve, and he was like, "Gosh, bleep 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 bleep." I should have sent my list earlier because you stole two of my plants. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, I I usually try to get my my plant list in first for that reason, so that like you know you have dibs, um, and you had you had a couple on there that I was going to have on there, um, did, you know same same genus, not not same the exact genus, same plant, different species, and, yeah. yeah, and and so like I I just but I had I had so many to pick from, you know, like I had okay. like a, I had like eight or nine, I, so I just you know bopped some out and bopped some other ones in and 
Um, oh, okay. So all right. So yeah. we don't have any crossovers then. No, no. Cause oh, I mean, right. that, that, that would be kind of, it's kind of cheating the, the, uh, the listeners to, okay. to instead, instead of having eight plants, they would only get like what, six. All right. Um, okay. Or, well, you know, so so. Give me your yeah. first one then, because I have no idea what's coming at me. I well, have not seen your list. That's, that's because the only the first person needs to send their list. And just to make sure the other person doesn't have those, the other person doesn't then need to send their list. It gets to be, it's like, it's like, if you get to go first, you get dibs on the plants, but if you go second, you get to throw the curveballs. Mm, okay. In there, all right. which, which I did not throw any this time. Um, okay. All right. But you know, when I said, oh my gosh, I've got to come up with a list of only four perennials. The first thing that popped into my mind was, was all gold Japanese forest grass, mm-hmm. uh, Hakanakloa, Macra, all gold, um, grows in zones five to nine. Um, and I thought of this plant because it's such a, it's such a strong performer. It's one of those plants that looks good I- I- anywhere you put it, you know, in, in a partial shade to full shade setting. Like it just, it, it just looks good there. Yeah. And that's, if, if you're going to have only a few perennials, you need something that's that versatile and that you can rely on. Um, so uh, all gold gets to be about, you know, 12 to 18 inches tall. Uh, maybe twice as wide. It actually just keeps expanding and expanding, um, which is another good thing. It's going to uh, eventually take up um, quite a, a bit of ground and it's easy to divide and mm-hmm. can take division uh, readily. Uh, but the foliage is chartreuse um, going to, to more yellow, the more sun that it gets uh, to almost all green um, if it's in full shade. Um, but, and so it, it's a very versatile color. Uh, its texture goes w- with anything. There are a lot of cultivars of Japanese forest grass, but I picked all gold because it's, to me, it's the most versatile. Uh, there are a lot of cultivars which just kind of look normal and then turn a little bit of color in, in fall. Like they look good in fall, but the rest of the season, they're kind of meh. Uh, you've got, you've got um, uh, Oriola, you know, which mm-hmm. is, which, ha- which has the yellow leaf with the green stripe on it, which is fantastic. But that's, that was a little too... It can be a little too bright sometimes. I um, also don't think that's as hardy a grower as all gold. I've grown both and I've seen both. And I think all gold beefs up and holds its own better than Oriola, in my personal experience and opinion. I wouldn't I wouldn't argue with that. Uh, but I do have to say that my Oriola got the, the center of it chowed out by Vols um, a year okay. or two ago. Um, and so... And then there's Albo striata, which has like the green leaf with the, mm-hmm. the creamy white stripe down it, which is just, it's, it's not enough, you know, um, and, and I have all three of them. And like I said, they're the ones that, that, that turn red in fall. Um, but to, to me, this just always looks good. It comes back early in spring, which a lot of grasses don't. Um, in winter, you know, it, it turns brown and looks dead, um, which is supposed to. But, you know, it catches the snow. It catches frost. Um, and, and, you know, it looks like the garden in winter. Um, there's really no downside to it other than I can't go full, full sun, you know? Um, yeah. it's just, it's just that versatile. And I was just thinking this morning, wow, I have to, I have to divide that and move that somewhere else. Uh, because it's just, um, it, it's doing well. It's, it's not, it's not a, um, a rapacious, you know, grabber of land and choking things out, but you can not see start, start, yeah. start, starting to encroach on, on other guys, um, so you take a hunk out and, and, and stick it somewhere else. And then you've got repetition in your garden, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, and, and again, I don't have to water it a lot. I, I, the only care I give all gold Japanese forest grass or any Japanese forest grass is to cut back the spent foliage in like, you know, March or April when you're kind of just looking for stuff to do anyway. And, mm-hmm. and I have, I have think you could take the weed whacker to it too. You know, <laughs> um, and just do it. And, uh, I, and I love kind of like leaving like, you know, I, I'm great for leaving things lying around. Uh, if you leave some of the um, the spent foliage around that you've cut off, like you'll you'll see you'll see a bird landing, you know, grabbing some of that and then flying off with it to to make a nest, uh, which I always think is kind of neat. That is, and I I would say you know you were like oh it looks brown it looks dead. I actually think that it looks really pretty when it it basically dies. It's it's kind of a tawny color, and because those blades are a little bit thicker it doesn't just look like a dead grass. It almost looks like bamboo, you know, like a, a short bamboo. And I always, 
I don't know, maybe it's just me, but I always love it when, you know, bamboo does that, where it goes to that tawny. And maybe that's because we live in New England and there ain't all that much going on in February. But I think it actually looks kind of quite pretty when it when it's, you know, past past its uh, living stage. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I like it too, but I didn't want it to make it seem like it's somehow like, oh, it has beautiful winter interests. Like, no, it just looks okay. You know, yeah, like it, it, does, okay. It, it doesn't look ugly. It doesn't look like nothing. You know, no. like something. No, no, no. Which is yeah. kind of all you need. It's all you need in winter. Uh, and the, yeah. the one, the one, the one mistake I did make this was to plant it with bamboo, oh. because well, two things happened. Number one, it blended so well with the bamboo that the, 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 they were too they were too close. You kind of couldn't mm-hmm. see where the bamboo stopped and and the um, the all gold started. Mm-hmm. And then eventually, the bamboo, even though it was always clumping bamboo, expanded so much that it shaded out. Uh, oh, yeah, this yeah. grass so uh i i cut back um the bamboo and the the all gold is making a rebound you know in that area so i wish that i had planted all gold right from the start as opposed to carrick's bowls golden because i've struggled over the years with carrick's bowls golden it basically it, it's it starts out beautiful when i first plant it and then it slowly dies off and comes back less and less each year until eventually it's gone and i wish that i just hadn't done that i wish i had just gone for all gold because it was similar conditions and similar look but far superior hardiness to it um so yeah that was a mistake i made so i would dare i say i would i would just go with all gold hacnogloa over Carex bowls golden. Um, okay, so I had to pick a peony because it's my favorite flower. It's my favorite flowering perennial. There is eight million different varieties. I have a plethora of different peonies. Um, you know, I don't think that you can go wrong with a peony. Actually, uh, herbaceous peonies, ito peonies, tree peonies. Peonies are just awesome. They really are. They're for as beautiful and intricate of blossoms and the plants with these deeply lobed dark green leaves. It looks like a specimen plant. They're not. They're incredibly easy to care for. You chuck them in the ground. They don't require much. The voles, for the most part, have left mine alone, um, which is remarkable. And I actually have a couple peonies in my vole superhighway. So that's great to know as well. Um, I just would say my favorite, the one that I would recommend to everybody for a, for a general species is Festiva Maxima, which is not anything probably that anyone isn't heard of, but it is a double gorgeous white bloom, extremely fragrant. At the very center of the Festiva Maxima bloom is this little bit of pinky red. So just right smack dab in the center of it. Um, blooms like gangbusters. I have one plant right now. I had to go out this morning and count. I have over 30 buds on one Festiva Maxima plant. It's incredible. Now that's a plant that's been in the ground for me for over seven years, but it's spectacular. And peonies get to be two and a half to three feet tall and wide, kind of bulky. Of course, it's all about the blooms. You will need to stake most of them. However, the Ito peonies, which are a cross between the herbaceous and tree peonies, those kind of, you know, stand themselves upright. They don't really need staking and tree peonies for the most part don't either. Herbaceous peonies, most of them are going to need some stakes because they get those giant blossoms, but that's not anything. I actually put those rings on years and years ago, and I never take them out. I just leave them year round and the peony grows right back up through it the next year. So it's awesome. Um, Yeah, I I just, I love, love, love it. Uh, The one caveat I will say zones three to eight, it's pretty, you know, large zonal range as well. Full sun. It's not picky about soil, just likes well-drained, doesn't like to sit in water any of the peonies because they tend to rot. And you just want to be good about cleaning up and fall around it. The dead foliage of the peonies and any leaves that fall because they're prone to botrytis. So they will get um, this weird disease that um, is is mainly caused by not cleaning up around them. So that, that that's the one, you know, maintenance that you have to do to them. But man, I just, 
I love peonies. I, I don't think that the, that you could go wrong. I, I've never heard somebody say like, oh, that was a really stinker peony. It, it just doesn't happen. <laughs> Yeah, you know, pe- peonies is one of the ones I was going to put on my list too, um, mm-hmm. and uh, you know, for all the reasons that you said, um, the the only downside I would add to them too, if you can consider it a downside, because it's it's not really, is that you know after you know after they bloom, they really have nothing going on. So in spring when they come up, their foliage is kind of colorful, mm-hmm. um, and the anticipation is exciting. Like, look, my peonies back, uh, and then they bud, and then they bloom and look great. But then after that, they're, they're really nothing um, in the garden, which is, I mean, which is OK. I mean, that's that's what most plants are. But you just you just have to be aware of that, that like if you if you if you plant 50 peonies and think you're going to have a great garden, you no, are no, going to have a great yeah. garden until like you know mid-June. Um, yeah. So 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 they're they're great to pair with a summer bloomer, you know, like something that's going to bloom inside like a daylily or something like that. Mm-hmm. Um but so, let's be I mean, clear, that's, that's, they don't die back. They don't die back. I no, mean, no, it's no. Not so, like so they bloom I, I, and they yellow right. out. Yeah. Yeah. So all, all you're gonna get is green foliage. But you need that somewhere so that mm-hmm. so that you, you do have some things that are taking over and they, they have something to play off of, you know. Um and, and that's 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 not a knock, but just they're not gonna carry um the, you know, the interest all year long. They're just gonna have like a a, 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 a you know a, a maximum festival of, of interest, um, you know, for a short period of time, yeah. but it's worth it. It's totally worth it. And, I, and totally. I think, I think, I think you like that cultivar because the, the, um, the cultivar name translates as enormous party. Um, Yay! You, know. <laughs> you nailed it. That's exactly yeah. why. Steve, do you have any shade plants on your list? I just gave you a shade plant, Danielle. Japanese forest grass is for, Oh, yeah. Do you have any sun plants <laughs> on your list? I I do listen I, to you when you talk. I, I do. I, I do. I do. I also have shade plants on my list. I have sun <laughs> plants. I you know, um, but let let me let me wind up with the shade because it's the next uh, in okay, my notes. All right. um, and because you're obviously interested in shade plants, um, <laughs> uh, you know, the other shade plant that I want to recommend uh, again is um, is pretty common, but it's common for a reason. Uh, because it's great. And it's summon substance hosta. Mm. Um, it, you know, if you're only going to have one perennial or two perennials in your garden, and one of them is Japanese forest grass, make the other one summon substance hosta because it has a, a lot of the same um, wonderful attributes that Japanese forest grass has in that um, it has year long presence with without any work from you. Asterisk deer will eat it. Um, so if, if you don't have deer, you're, you're all set. Um, but other and not than that, year round, I mean, this is not an evergreen. Well, I, I, what, 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 what I mean from spring to, to frost, you know, yes. like it's, it's not going to wait. Like I have, um, I have ferns, you know, it's almost Memorial day and they're just starting to pop up. I'm like, where have you been? <laughs> you know, uh, welcome to the party. Um, but no, this, this comes up early in spring, you know, um, does it, and because it has huge leaves, this is like a foot long you know, leaves of chartreuse, um, it, it immediately has a presence in the garden and, and it will take that all the way into to frost uh, when it dies. So as these big chartreuse leaves, the plant's going to get to be three feet tall and then, you know, just keep expanding to maybe like four or five feet wide. Could even go grow, grow bigger, but at some point you're going to divide it, you know, just because you want more, uh, more plants. Um, but it has, it has that, it's, it, it looks good enough on its own you know, to, to, to attract interest. It requires no effort from you, uh, but also doesn't steal the show. If you want to have some other showy guys uh, around it too. Um, it gets uh, like purple flowers. Um, I never really noticed them, um, but zones three, three day. Um, no, because that's, okay. that's work. I might walk by <laughs> them and think maybe I should cut those off, but that would be as far as I would get uh, to that because okay. there's, there's other more things to more, more interesting things to be, to be done. Um, okay like taking a nap or something like that. Um, but Fair. yeah, but it requires nothing of you, um, has presence is going to look good for a long period of time. Um, uh, so yeah, I mean, that's, that's a perennial that you want in your garden asterisk as long as you don't have deer. Yeah, yeah. 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 Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, I think that there's several of the, the larger hostas that, 
that I would say, yeah, absolutely. I would yeah. say Francis Williams is yep. another good one. Guacamole is my jam. I love guacamole. It's got, it's actually the one, I think I've talked about this. I don't cut the flowers off for a hosta because they're fragrant, but yeah, a, a big bulky hosta that brings me such joy in spring too, because they do emerge so early. And I just think, yes, Spring has sprung. Here it is. Yeah. This is yeah. awesome. <laughs> wow. and because some in substance has corrugated leaves, and in fact, a lot of these larger ones have corrugated uh, leaves to them, that supposedly is less interesting to slugs. Um, I, don't, yeah. I don't know why. I don't know why, but uh, that's that's what they say. And I haven't had an issue with, knock on wood, with slugs uh, on any of my large leaf hostas. And yeah, I had a list of them, uh, Francis Williams, uh, guacamole, Wula La is another one, which just keeps yeah. getting bigger and bigger every year. Like this year, it's, it's scary huge. Um, uh, yeah, I'm actually a little frightened of it. Um, but yeah, a big leaved hosta uh, yeah. is just is just a great perennial to go with uh, for for partial uh, to full shade and no deer. Yes. Yes, yes. Or per- somehow protect them from the deer. Well, I'm I'm upset though because you just knocked ferns and I was going to go into I didn't. I didn't knock knock ferns. It's just that <laughs> that one. Like I have plenty of ferns that are up and and doing their thing. Like yeah. we're talking. It's it's just before Memorial Day, and most of my ferns are up and doing their thing. But uh, Dryopteris erythrosora brilliance is yeah. just coming back. You know, um, and it, it's really it's 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 on its. You know, this is its second year. They always take a little while to to perk up. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, it's 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 a little late. But they, yeah. Uh, yeah, all my other ferns, like my Ethereums, uh, ha, have, hey, have, have, hey. have come back. Hey, you stop that. You stop that because you saw my list. So that's what I was going to talk about was painted ferns. That's my next one, Ethereum. Um, and it's really hard because they're all over the place, but there's all different sorts of Ethereums. And some of them are just Ethereum and then a really cool cultivar like Godzilla, which is a really ginormous, huge painted fern. And then there's a bunch of them that are considered Japanese painted ferns. And then there's, you know, uh, lady ferns that are thrown in in there. But you know what? I'm not going to talk about the lady ferns. I want to talk about the painted ferns. And they're just gorgeous, gorgeous ferns. We're talking a foot to a foot and a half tall and wide, not gigantic. And any painted fern that you get is going to be some combination of white, silver, purple, little bit of green. And sometimes that purple is so dark that it's almost a little bit black. Um, And these ferns are a mixture of those colors. It's kind of surreal. It sounds a little gaudy. It sounds like Mardi Gras, but it's not. They're just absolutely stunning. And especially in shade, that combination of a little bit of dark green slash dark purple with a little accent of white or silver is just focal point city. I mean, your eye is immediately drawn to that painted fern and you're going, wait, what's that? I mean, especially with a backdrop of, you know, lush green hostas or, you know, something along those lines. So I've learned that I just love painted ferns because when I'm looking in the shade, a lot of times I go, gosh, it just needs a little pop of something. And every time I reach into my bag and I pull out a painted fern of some kind, My latest one that I'm hot to trot on is a relatively newer cultivar. It's called Crested Surf. So it's a it's a painted fern that tends to be more on the a lot more white slash silver highlights. And then at the very end of the frond, it has this little tuffet, like this little mini fern tuff at the at the like a like a wave breaking. Maybe that's why it's crested surf. But it just gives you that little something extra for the texture. You just want to, you know, kind of tousle it a little bit because it's so cute and so nice. Um, The other thing that I have found, which is key for me, because a lot of the shade that I have is actually underneath trees. Um, Once established, painted ferns are relatively drought resistant and they'll do pretty well in dry shade. And I can't say that for a lot of other ferns that I've tried and experimented with, but um, I'm going to put a photo up on the uh on our show notes on the website here if you want to see these plants that we're talking about go to our website but it's at the base of a mature hemlock tree and we're talking 
couple of inches away from the trunk of this hemlock tree and looks great and does great all summer long, even when well, even all spring long this year when we haven't had a drop of rain in several weeks. So, you know, Japanese painted ferns, I, I mentioned Crested Surf, I mentioned Godzilla. I'm a big fan of Pearly White too, which is another newer cultivar. You're, you're, you're cheating. Ah! It's, only, it's, it's only four cultivars. You know, it was like this giant broad thing and now you're naming like six within this one group that's you know i mean i don't i don't think that you could pick a bad painted fern and that's ethereum um is the genus and there's all sorts of amazing cultivars um and 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 also species to be to be quite frank so what did you do to get that fern beneath the hemlock established you must have watered it a lot i watered it consistently not a lot the first year the first year I planted it in spring. Um, and this is now three or four years. Um, it was a sample plant, you know, this was something that came in as a sample plant and I have such limited shade that I thought, all right, well, let's give it a go here. Watered it pretty consistently the first year. And then after that, I I've mulched it, you know, I mulch around it with, with some shredded bark mulch. I haven't watered it since. Not even when we had a severe drought last year, it did crisp up a little bit, you know, uh, especially on the edges. But then by fall, when the rains returned, it had pushed new growth. And this year it looks gangbusters. I mean, the the photo that I'm going to post is one that I took yesterday. Um, It's it. Yeah. So established the first year. And I did the same thing for a couple of others that I I've thrown in on kind of the woodland edge of, of my garden and same thing watered consistently. And, you know, you know, me and consistent, it's like, Oh, okay. I've got the hose out. Might as well throw some in that direction. Yeah. I, um, uh, I planted two crested surf, um, uh, eventually, um, so, so they were, they were stressed by the time they got in the ground. Um, only one came back. One was struggling because I wasn't consistent with the water in that first year. Mm-hmm. And this year I, I was looking at the spot where it was supposed to be and saying to myself, isn't there supposed to be a crested surf here? Like I see the oh, other yeah. one over there. Where's this guy? And like, not a, not even like dried <laughs> fronds or anything like that. There's like no, no, no evidence that that, that, that thing was ever there. Um, oh no! I actually have a couple plants like that. Um, I actually have. Yeah, side note: uh, I have a couple Mardigan lilies. I planted three of them, and then I was out yesterday, and I can only see one. I saw all three coming up earlier in the year, and Do now you there's voles. Because like, no, because you know voles and lilies. No, because there's there's nothing else that's that's gone there, and um, you would you would still see the dry stalk there. True, you know, just with, with nothing sure. underneath it. There's no stalk. There's no no one chewed it to the. They just disappeared. Weird. And there's there's no like dirt churned up where like something ripped it out like it's just they just disappeared as though you know alien abduction type thing. But I don't that's think that's really a, I don't strange. think that's a possibility. I'm ruling that out because I would have heard the the UFO. Um, <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm going to turn my attention to sun now. All right. Um, and uh, again, I'm looking for a plant that has uh, versatility, like long season versatility. Um, the foliage is going to look good all year. And if it has, this one actually has blooms on it. Unlike my, my previous two, which have flowers, but you know, not anything to be note, uh, noted, but this plant, um, is, uh, is millennium allium. Um, mm. it's, it's the ornamental alliums and millennium might be the, the best of the bunch. It was kind of like the, 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 um, there's a, a number of different cultivars that are coming now, but millennium kind of like paved the way for these in some mm-hmm. regard. Um, and so it's it's about a uh, about a foot and a half tall with a wonderful green, you know, uh, foliage, strappy foliage. It stays upright. Um, and then about, you know, mids, mids uh, uh, to me, it, it's all summer, uh, but it's probably midsummer to, to the end of summer. It gets these little um, pom poms that are in, you know, they sit in the intersection of, of pink and purple, uh, maybe more purple than pink. But there's certainly some pink in there. Um, and, and you know how I am with colors, uh, but that's, says, that's, says that's, Steve, the color expert. Yeah, but you know, you know what I mean. It's like somewhere in that, you know. No, uh, I thought you did a brilliant job with yeah. that. Actually, there's there's, there's somewhere good. in between them. Are they pink? Not really. Are they purple? Not completely. Uh, they're somewhere in between that too. Um, and so that you get these little pom poms um, that that rise above this this handsome foliage. Uh, last pretty much all summer. 
Um, and they fade to, to you know, just little like ghostly gray pom-poms and just sort of gradually disintegrate. Um, zones four to eight, super easy to grow. Um, uh, you know, I, I don't even know what conditions they need because they seem to thrive wherever I put them. Yeah. Um, but, you know, sun, the more sun, the better. They're obviously not going to take full shade. Um, I have them in partial shade, doing great. Um, I have them in dry spots. Um, I don't have any moist spots. Um, and, and they're doing they're doing fine. But they, uh, again, with that foliage, it just stays up. That is, again, versatile because you can, you can pair it with anything. Anything combines with that just, you know, upright, strappy grass foliage, kind of like a wide grass uh, blade. You know, mm -hmm. and and you can use that that texture, you know, to 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 work with uh, with pretty much anything, you know, um, and then it gets the, the the cool round shape in the summer. Um, again, like it's just a plant that's going to look good for a long period of time without much or any work from you. I don't think I, I don't even think I cut back the foliage on these things. Like I don't do anything to them; they just pop up again, uh, and that's great. That's the kind of plant I need. Yes. Yes. Yeah. I will. I, I never, I don't think I ever ended up planting millennium, but I got the, uh, got serendipity, which came out shortly thereafter. And millennium has uh, green, glossy, strappy foliage and serendipity is slightly bluer. So it's a glaucousy blue with a little bit wider strappy blade to it, but love it. Absolutely love it. And same thing. I don't think I cut it back, but yet there was nothing left. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so, so I just want to be clear. We're, we're talking about these summer blooming alliums. There are the big yes. sort of, uh, you know, mid late spring blooming alliums, which are, you know, the big bulbs that you, that you plant, the foliage comes up, dies back, and then you get the bloom. Yeah. These, these um, put up foliage, you know, right in spring and the foliage stays up and looks good all year. Um, much like your dog behind you. Um, and, 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 and then, and then it has blooms. Um, yeah. <laughs> Hold on. Hi, Bergy. <laughs> he got, he, he, Sorry well, about that. <laughs> like, like, so, like so many people, he got tired of hearing me talk. <laughs> he, she can't hear you. She can't hear you. <laughs> Hold on. I'm sorry. That, that door doesn't close. Okay. All right. Hooray. <laughs> I'm back. Well, yes, I, I will say that that is a very good, solid choice of perennial. And I do love these perennial alliums. Um, I'm going to talk about a plant that I think you're really mad at me for putting on my list. And um, that's, <laughs> that's Amsonia tabermontania, which is Eastern Blue Star. And I thought for sure that you were going to put Amsonia hubrichtii on there and we would have a battle of the Amsonias going on, but you decided against it. Well, well why? Because I, I will bring it up in response to your recommendation and then, <laughs> then, I, then I get to throw in another plant you know, as well. There uh, you but go. But yes, oh. now that you brought it up, Amsonia hubrichtii is much superior to... No, okay, okay. <laughs> go ahead, go ahead. So, you know, I love Eastern Blue Star. It's uh, native to Eastern North America. And I have both, you know, I have Hubrichtii and I have Tabermontania and they're both beautiful plants. You know, you can't go wrong with either one of them. But I, I went for Eastern Blue Star instead to talk about zones four to nine, simply because I've grown to appreciate it over the years more than I thought I would. It's got more of a lance shaped leaf. It has more of a bulky presence than that fine wispy foliage of, of um, Hubrick DI. And each one of those lance shaped leaves has a silver stripe down the center of it. And the stems are a little silvery too, which, you know, th and they're glossy and th it's just an attractive plant when it's not in bloom. And I never thought that it really would be. I had gotten this as a pass along plant and thought, meh, all right, I'll just chuck it in over here. But then it gets 
um, clusters of star-like blue flowers around this time of year. You know, we're talking the, the, the end of spring, beginning of summer. They last for a pretty long time, several weeks, and then they go by. They have these really cool seed pods um, that remind me of um, Asclepias seed pods. You know, they're kind of long and angular. Um it's just a really great plant. It stays in this lovely clump that's two to three feet tall, about two feet wide, full sun to partial shade. I actually have it in a bit of partial shade and it still does well. Well-drained soil, kind of on the lean side, doesn't need a super fertile soil. And then, you know, Amsonia hubrichtii's claim to fame is that it goes that brilliant color of yellow in fall. And it really is beautiful. Great texture. Well, you know, Tabermontania also gets great fall color. And it's almost more of a you know, orange to yellow transition. Um, really, really interesting. And I never realized how much great fall color it gets for a perennial and then eventually, you know, goes all yellow, just like Hubrick DI, and you know, then then basically goes dormant for the for the winter. But a really, really cool native plant, and I think doesn't get as much love and attention as Hubrick DI. But that's Eastern Blue Star, great native plant, and um, something that. I think still has good texture, even though maybe it's not as textural as Hubrichtii is. Yeah, you know, uh, Hubrichtii is my preferred uh, species there because of its extremely fine, think think pine needle um, type foliage um, that just always looks soft and cloudy and uh, and wonderful. And when I see pictures of Tabernay Montana, that I wonder why anyone would grow that over a hubrichtii. And then one day I saw this, basically a hedge of this beautiful looking shrub. And I said, oh, what is that? And I was told it was uh, Amsonia uh, Tabernay Montana. And I said, wow, that that's a really good looking shrub. So that's why people would grow that over a hubrichtii. It's, it's, it, um, you know, pictures don't do it justice. I think you have to see it uh, in person. I think it's, um, I think it, you know, personally, again, I, I prefer Hubrichtii. Um, it was kind of one of the first plants that I, that I, uh, that I fell in love with, um, when I knew what the heck I was thinking, you know, doing. Um, but, uh, Tabernay Montana, it, it's the straight species is, is not getting a, a, a lot of love, but it's, it's, there are a lot of cultivars coming off of that. So yeah, like a lot of the newer yeah, cultivars yeah. are Tabernay Montana. They're not Hubrichtii. Yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, gr- great plant. Again, that's another one. Easy to grow. Uh, pops up pretty early in the season, mm-hmm. long season of interest, looks good when it's out of bloom. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, I think I think that's a good plant, uh, almost as good as Hubrichtii, which is not on my list because you got yours in first. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, you know, it's so easy to grow deep, deep roots, like need, yeah. need no care. They, they, I don't know if Tabernay Montana is like this, but Hubrichtii needs room. Like my, my big problem with them and I've been, I've been ripping them out because I, I just planted them too close to my walkway and they're just eating mm-hmm. up my walkway because they, they get really big. Um, and, uh, they reseed. Uh, I don't know if Tabernay Montana does, but, um, I have, uh, Tabernay, so I didn't mention that, but it doesn't, well, it, it mm-hmm. doesn't to my experience so far. So I have Hubert DI seedlings that pop up all over the place to the point where I just basically like weed them out. You know, it's not obnoxious, but they pop up all over the place. I haven't had that happen with Tabernay Montana. It just doesn't happen. I wish it did. It's one of those I wish that it did, but I don't know what's going on. Maybe it's because of the situation that it's in, because I do know that, you know, you read references and it says it may self seed, but it hasn't yet for me. Yeah. And it's been I, uh, in there a while. I didn't uh, I didn't notice my Amsonias seeding around uh, until like I started to grow them from seed. Mm-hmm. And then I, I started saying like, well, gosh, there's seedlings here already. You know, like yeah. I, you kind of have to look for them. Uh, and, and now they're 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 everywhere. Um, but yeah, like if if you're only going to have four perennials, one of them should be an Amsonia. Absolutely. Preferably Hubrick DI. <laughs> Last. So my last plant is also uh, a sun plant, um, common common genus um, Nepeta, uh, the catmint oh, family. Yes. 
Um, I, I think I think all of them um, are good. Um, but the one that I'm going to recommend is, is probably the biggest six Hills giant cat mint. Um, and I, I like it because it's big and because it does all the other things that, that a cat mint does. So a cat mint will have like, you know, gray, um, foliage, you know, it, it forms a, a wonderful, nice, uh, clump, uh, maybe about two feet wide. And we'll, this one will get to be two feet wide and about three feet tall, uh, gray foliage with, um, you know, uh, purple flowers in in late spring, early summer, around Memorial Day. Mine blooming right now, um, and it's right before Memorial Day. Um, and it, it it's it gets big and bulky, so it, you know it's taking up space and it feels like it's doing its job, but it's kind of airy, so it doesn't feel oppressive or it doesn't feel like it's that big. And um, after it blooms, it, it can fall open a little bit, you know, mm-hmm. and expose its center. Uh, and you could you can cut it back to, to new growth, and and that that would be the only maintenance that I give it. Um, I don't even do that with this one because I I have it planted in such uh, such a place that you can't tell that it's falling falling open. Um, but it just it just does its job without me. I don't even clean up in spring after it anymore because the new foliage just kind of grows up and and covers over the old foliage. Mm-hmm. Um, you 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 can shear it back, you know. Um, after it blooms, if you don't want the, the spent blooms, um, that's fine. But you, but you can be rough with it. You don't have to be. You don't have to cut back to the second set of five leaves off of. You know, like you don't have to worry about that. You just boom, just shear it back. It can take whatever you throw at it. Um, full sun to partial shade, average to dry soil. I've gotten some very dry um, spots. In fact, I have a, a lot of catmints growing in the worst places I have on my property. Um, but I like Six Hills Giant just because. Uh, just because of its size and its bulk, and, and again, uh, it, it's it, it feels like it's doing a lot just by existing, you know, in yeah. its in its in its massive size. So, yeah, I um, th- that is a little too big for me. Like, and even Walker's Low is a little too big for me, which I think is probably the one that's the best known of the catmints or has been for years is Walker's Low. But they've come out with a bunch of dwarf cat mints recently and i feel you know every single cultivar is escaping me now but i all feel like they're a play on like cats like per little persian or yeah. you know yeah. cats meow cat well, my, or whatever my favorite cultivar is um, a smaller version of walker's low it's called junior walker yeah um, <laughs> okay anybody who knows you know uh, shotgun um the, the famous song uh, and, and various other songs by the, the great Junior Walker, uh, but uh, I, I also have uh, I have Little Titch, uh, Little Titch, which, which, yes. which, which, which is a really uh, low growing one, um, and it's it's doing again. It's in a terribly inhospitable spot, just doing great. Just and it's it starts blooming Little Titch, which is not the one I'm recommending. So I get to talk about it. Um, it's not a bonus plant. It starts blooming almost immediately in spring and just goes yeah. all year. And usually that's a sign of a short-lived plant. If it blooms all year, it's not going to live very long. Uh, but now I've, I've had this, geez, six, seven years now. Um, yeah. and it's, it's doing great. You know, I wish it was a little better at choking out weeds because I've planted in like a big mass. Uh, but that's that's not what it's supposed to do. So um, yeah, little, little yeah. titch for me, I've gotten a couple of little titch. I think it was probably sample plants again. And where they are is so inhospitable that nothing else will grow there except for sedums, low growing sedums. Yeah. So if that gives you any inclination of how tough catmint can be, you know, sedum, sedum will grow in pure sand basically. <laughs> and this is, this is full sun, hot, hot, hot sun the worst of the worst soil. And that is the only other plant that I've gotten that will mix and mingle in there. And actually that's a really nice combination. I will say sedum dazzleberry. Awesome. With little titch cat mint. Awesome combo. Awesome. Awesome combo. All right. So that's funny that you picked a, a, I'll call it a bomb proof sun perennial. I'm going to choose a bomb proof shade perennial to end out my plants. And that's epimediums. Um, epimedium zones five to eight. Some of them can do four to nine, depending on which one you choose. I was, um, I wasn't into epimediums for the longest time. I want to say probably up until maybe three or four years ago, I was not an epimedium fan. I, I think because 
you know, everybody's like, oh, it's an evergreen perennial. Well, big whoop, you know, out here we get so much snow that really, is that all I'm going to care about with this plant is that it's evergreen and it's buried in a snowbank three feet tall. I'm never going to see this plant. Who cares? But after having you know, these really inhospitable areas underneath trees and on woodland edges, I thought, ah, oh, you know, Epimedium's claim to fame is lean, dry, shade soil. It will, they will do great. So I started chucking in some Epimediums. Um, I think that they were actually divisions, perhaps from our office, <laughs> some little cast offs from our landscapers who had put in Epimediums years ago have no idea what ver what species they are. And they did really well. So then I started getting into epimediums and I started getting into a lot of the new Asian cultivars that have these longer leaves to them instead of kind of those heart-shaped leaves that epimediums I had come become accustomed to. And they have spines all over the leaves. And then, you know, nobody really talks all that much about Epimedium's flower show. And I thought, oh yeah, you know, great. You see these close-ups in catalogs and they look like these really intricate little orchid-like flowers. And then you, you discover that they're literally microscopic in size, but the plants get covered in them. So it's clouds of flowers that are kind of dangling above that, that, you know, dense foliage. Great plant. I mean, I, I was wrong. I was totally wrong about epimediums. Um, one that I had picked up a few years ago, I think from the plant sale was spine tingler. And I'll throw a photo of that up on the, uh, on the website. Um, one to one and a half, maybe feet tall by two to three feet wide. They eventually kind of like the Hacnocloa mass out and make kind of a, a nice low growing ground cover. Um, just great in the worst spots, dry, dry, dry shade, which arguably, but I will say not arguably, is the worst condition to try and get plants to grow in, is the dry shade. And epimedium does great. Um, a lot of them even get fall color. You know, spine tingler for me turns, uh, gets a little bit of uh, this bronzy reddish hue to its foliage in fall. So, you know, yeah, it's evergreen. Yeah, sometimes it's covered up in a snowbank, but it puts on a beautiful spring flower show that lasts for, you know, well over a month. And it gets fall color. And it's just an ever present, really, really nice perennial for me. Um, I'm, I'm a fan. A, a new fan. Yeah, my, my epimediums bloom so early. You know, they, they bloom like around the times of tulips and daffodils, oh, um, yeah. which um, is that now when yours bloom? No, actually. So, well, right now, Spine Tingler is putting on a show like no other. So uh, it's mine, a bit later. My, mine were, were up and done blooming, you know, early on in spring. And at first I was a little dismayed. I'm like, why, why are you doing this now? You know, I like, can't, can't, can't you wait? Uh, but I, I liked it because it, it gave me the sense that the, the garden is getting up and going. Like mm -hmm. my tulips and daffodils, I think are like are they're like time killers. You know, like okay, you're here. It's like it's like in the restaurant when they when they give you the bread. You know, like mm -hmm. okay, here's just a little something to keep you going before before the main course. Uh, and sometimes the bread is great, and sometimes it's just bread. You know, um, and so that's to me that's what tulips and daffodils do. They're not really part of the whole thing but they're just something for me to do before everything gets going. Uh, but the epimediums coming up made me think like, wow, everything's getting going pretty early. Okay. This is good. It's going to be a good year. Things are coming back. Cause it's my, always my yeah. big fear. Like things are not coming back because um, some, like you said, some, some epimediums are evergreen and some are not. Mm -hmm. So the ones that, that are not like you could, there's like nothing there. You're like, Oh my God, is it gone? Is it dead? Like what happened? And then the ones that are evergreen have like three leaves on them that are brown and gnarled. And they just have like a little bit of green on them. And they're like saying, like, don't worry, Steve, I'm, I'm hanging in there for you. I, I'm giving you everything I got. You know, I'm like, oh, man, just just hang on. You know, summer's coming. You know, you'll get some some water and some 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 life soon, maybe. Um, but but I, lo I love that they bloom that early, that they are that prolific. For the, for the longest time, I avoided them. Uh, because I wanted the ones that had the reddish, you know, leaf to them, but yeah. and, and then they all fade to green by summer. I'm like, oh, I don't want those. Yeah. I want the ones with the. But they they all do that, and then 
And what I didn't realize is it's okay for them to fade to green in summer because they've already done their thing. And now their thing is to basically um, have something growing in those terrible spots beneath trees or whatever, yeah, or, or, or to be, yeah, to be like a, the, the base layer while, 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 you know, your ethereums are now coming up and doing their thing, you yeah. know? Um, and that's, that's, that's okay for, for a plant to be, to be doing nothing. Um, but it's still, it's still showy, especially the ones that you, that you talked about that have the, the cooler looking foliage, mm-hmm. uh, the, the long, narrow, spiny things. Uh, which are good, but you cheated again. You went with an entire genus instead of just, you know, just one. Uh, I didn't know well, we could I do that. I didn't know we could do that. Really, I don't really think you could go wrong with epimediums. You know, e- you know, even if it isn't the evergreen, you know, species, I don't think you can go wrong with epimediums. I really don't. For the longest time, I was also a little hesitant to do to get them because they're pricey. I mean, yep. we're talking, you know, you'll go in, you'll get a four inch pot. That'll be 20 some odd dollars. And I thought there is no way that these are worth it. Oh, no, they are worth it. Yeah. You know, and, and it's, just, it's the same with the Japanese forest grass. You know, they, mm. they, they're expensive for a small clump, but it's but it's worth the investment. And but to, to me, when I saw those high prices on, on Epimedia, it makes me think that they're 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 rare and dainty. <laughs> and and that that is not the case with these. Yeah, uh, no. I think tough, I think tough, they, tough. They, they just they just take a little while to bulk up. But then once they do, you know, they're yeah. they're getting bulky. You know, they're they're doing their thing. Um, so I think that's just why they're they're more expensive. They are small but mighty, like me. And now, because everything sounds better with a British accent, here's Peter with his thoughts about four perennials. Only four perennials, Danielle. I know it wasn't Steve who chose the topic, because if it were, the title would have been Only 35 or so Perennials with a List of Alternates. Oh well, Danielle decides on the topics, Steve just complains about them. But why four? From photography to interior design, the rule of three holds. Items in groups of three are more visually interesting, and so it is with plants. Very few perennials can stand alone, unless they are big and bulky, so a single plant alone rarely works. Planting two perennials together is better, but either they make up a weak mass, or if separated, they look like lonely sentinels guarding something. Three, as we said, just looks right. A stout, steady, definite group. Four can work too, but the trick is to divide the four into a group of three, and then plant the last one a short bit away. Don't make it too far so it doesn't bear any relation to the main group. You want it to seem as though the eldest child of the family had grown up and moved away, but not across the country, Merely above the garage. Well, that's enough maths for one episode. Just remember Steve's rule of gardening number five. If in doubt, buy more plants. So, you know, Peter's picking on me again this week. You know, he was the nicer, kinder Peter for a few weeks, and now he's going hard on my my lack of number skills and math skills. But... I wasn't hired to be a mathematician. You know, um, honestly, I think I got it worse than you did from Peter. <laughs> and I think we have to talk to him about about that. I don't know where he's getting this, this stuff he's talking about. But let's see. Let's see what our expert has to say and see if she agrees with with any of us on, on, on our plant picks. And let's just say if she does agree with with any of us on our plant picks, then that person is the winner of the episode. OK. <laughs> Bold statement, but let's well, see. I'm just, I have, I haven't, I haven't heard uh, what the expert has to say. Oh, oh, sure, but, but let's, sure, let's, you let's, have it. Sure, let's let's find out what we, what she has to say. Okay, fine. Hi, my name is Susan Morrison, and I'm a landscape designer in Concord, California, which is located in the San Francisco Bay Area. And I have to say, narrowing down to only four perennials is really a challenge because I love the color that perennials bring to the garden. I want to just start out by sharing my criteria to make my top four list. And first, a plant has to have a long season of bloom. Because if I'm only going to get four perennials, then they all really need to work for me. And between all four, I want to make sure that I've got flower color spring through fall. Second, they have to be able to handle full sun because it gets up into the 90s or even higher in my part of the country. Third, where I live, we cycle in and out of drought on a regular basis, so the ability to thrive with very little water is key. And finally, I want very little maintenance. I like perennials that only need to be cut back once a year with maybe a mid-season haircut. 
My first choice is Mirage Purple Salvia. And I love this salvia because it stays small. It gets about two by two, which is a very handy size in the garden. In my mild climate, it starts blooming pretty early, as early as late March, definitely by early April. And it blooms all the way through fall until the weather really starts to turn. But having said that, the heaviest bloom is definitely late spring into summer. And after that, it starts to taper off and the plant won't look quite as tidy anymore. This is a woody perennial. So people sometimes get a little confused and think that they should treat it like a shrub and only prune it lightly. But you really should give it a hard prune at whatever time of the year perennial pruning is common where you live. Here, I would prune it uh, towards the end of January. If purple is not your color, the Mirage series has other colors, including some really attractive pink varieties. My second choice is one that you're probably familiar with, Achelia, or just plain old common yarrow. And there are a, there's a lot of colors and there's a lot of newer varieties out there. But for this plant, I prefer the ones that have been around for a while. And in fact, the yellow cultivars, Moonshine and Coronation Gold, are probably my favorites. They have an exceptionally long bloom season. They're, in fact, they're only out of bloom for a few months of the year. And the color is a really vibrant yellow. And you may know this, but what looks to us like an individual flat saucer type of a flower is actually made up of a whole lot of tiny flowers. So that really helps make this a fantastic pollinator plant. But it also means that as the season wears on, the plant will tend to have a mix of live and spent blooms. If that look bothers you, then you can deadhead. But one of the reasons that I gravitate towards the yellow color for this particular perennial is because I find that the different colors are pretty harmonious, whereas I don't like the mix as much of old with new on some of the pink and red varieties. Definitely make sure you plant this in a place where it's going to get lots of sunshine because in part shade, it's going to get leggy and it's going to tend to fall over. So you would need to stake it. Another purple flowering plant that I really like is Nepeta or Catmint. And the flower itself is similar looking to lavender, but it has a softer aspect to it and it has a much longer bloom season. For this particular plant, the strongest bloom is going to be in the spring. It's also an early starter, uh, April. And by summer, most of the flowers will have turned brown. But if you just shear off those spent stems, you'll get a whole second flush of blooms. I really like the cultivar drop more. It seems to bloom more vigorously than some, but the easiest one to find typically is Walker's Low, which is not a great name because it's not low. It can actually get two and a half to three feet high and wide. So if you do want lower growth for the front of the border and you can find Kit Kat or Junior Walker, they're not going to get as tall, although they will, they will still be as wide. And my final choice is a California native called Epilobium. It used to be classified as Dalshanaria, so you might know it by that name. The common name is California fuchsia, and it's called that because the small coral flowers are shaped like a fuchsia, but the two plants are actually not related. There are upright varieties, but I really like the ground-hugging ones like Wayne Silver and Everett's Choice. The foliage is a really beautiful soft gray, so it looks pretty even before it starts to flower. And it'll typically start blooming in midsummer, and it goes all the way through fall. And when it's blooming, it makes this beautiful carpet of bright coral flowers it, and that look particularly nice if you plant it close to a pathway where it can spill over a little bit. This plant is a magnet for hummingbirds, so it's a great choice to add if you want to attract more hummers into your garden. And it's actually classified as a very low water plant. And typically it can get by being watered as little as every couple of weeks. And there you have my top four perennial picks. You totally set me up. You knew exactly what she was gonna say. You probably fed her the plants to talk about. I am calling, what do they call that? A hung jury. Yes, that's it, a hung jury. There, There can be no winner in this case, Steve, because you cheated. I didn't, I didn't cheat and call it what you want, but the, the expert agreed with one of my plants and zero of yours. So that is, that is, that is not accurate. I'm, I'm getting Susan Morrison on the phone right now to find out what happened behind the scenes to make you the winner. You cheated. I know you did.